In today's video, I'm going to talk about medicinal plants, um, where they grow and the conditions under which they grow. This is part of the OCR A-level spec for disease dilemmas, talking about how we can get medicines from nature, but also I'm going to talk about a specific plant, the rosy periwinkle, and the conditions under which um, it has grown. The first thing that I want to discuss is the idea that we've been taking medicines from nature hasn't just appeared, it's been actually been done for thousands of years. We can see on this piece of pottery that there is um, the, the Grecians actually took uh, leaves from trees and they put it in their tea and then used it as medicine, um, but also all across the world. So the Arab world has also got similar medicines that it's found from being and living with nature. An example of this is uh, Hippocrates. He actually found 300 medicinal plants during his lifetime. And this is one of the factors that led to his wide uh, medicinal knowledge and why he's known as the, the father of medicine. I'm now going to talk about actual examples of um, medicines that we find in nature and the conditions under which they grow and what they do. So I'm going to start with salicin. This is from the bark of the white willow and that's what a white willow looks like. It's often found um, in wet and waterlogged conditions. So you find them by the sides of riverbanks, um, on floodplains and wetlands. And because of this, it's actually one of those plants that can grow in quite a lot of soil types. So you can get it in light sands, but also in heavy clay. Similarly, you can find it in slightly acidic soils and slightly alkaline. So it's quite a um, versatile and hardy plant. The, the, the bark, when it's um, crushed down and used, we use it actually for pain relief. So it acts a bit like an aspirin. Uh, and it was Hippocrates that actually suggested that we use this, first of all, to, to kind of solve migraines. The next one's a slightly more obvious um, drug that we might know, caffeine, which we find in tea, coffee and coca plants. This obviously comes from a tropical climate where temperatures are above 20 degrees and there's a lots of rainfall. Here's an example um, of a uh, farm um, in Colombia, which is in those conditions, um, lots of vegetation. It also needs kind of well-drained soils and lots of those um, leaves will fall onto the ground, which gives the soil uh, lots of organic matter and uh, nitrogen. Therefore, you need very fertile soils to uh, for this uh, caffeine to, to grow. This is used as a stimulant, so as we, we use it for when we drink tea, it kind of stimulates us, it perks us up. It's also used um, uh, in drugs to, to get rid of migraines and during uh, epidural, so during childbirth you can use uh, caffeine, which is actually um, in the epidural. The next thing is quinine and uh, this is from the, again, it's from a tree, it's uh, from the chincona tree, and it's at the dried bark, so it's got a kind of red colour when you look at it. Um, it's, again, in conditions where it's warm, so over 20 degrees and you can't have any frost. Not so much in terms of kind of rain as other places, but you do have to have quite humid conditions for it to uh, it, it exist. So you often find this in places like India um, and West Asia. Again, drained soils, fertile, lots of organic matter. These, these are in those tr tr tropical and subtropical conditions where you need um, lots of nutrients being put into the soil and the soils to be able to kind of have the water drain away. Otherwise, it, that you can't, the plant won't grow well. As you can see from the picture, this is used um, to combat malaria and it actually kills parasites uh, in the red blood cells. There's an interesting kind of story that goes around with this. The British East India Company in India were trying to get rid of malaria. Um, and they, they found out that quinine, a Scottish doctor found that quinine could actually kill parasites. So they started drinking it with tonic water. But tonic water is unfortunately quite bitter. And so what they actually do is they added gin, which they got, um, they were given a, a kind of ration of gin and that to take away the bitter tonic. And that's actually how the gin and tonic was invented. So it was initially as a kind of malarial um, uh, antidote and the, the kind of quinone and the tonic were, were used with gin to, to make it actually taste nice. Another one is morphine. This is uh, from opium poppy seeds and we can see it's this actual dried latex that we get coming out of the seeds. Again, warm conditions, very warm, over 30 degrees and it doesn't like either wet weather or frost. 
drain soils most of these ones need lots of very drain soils and again lots of that humus which is that kind of organic matter dead leaves that's getting recycled in the top layer of the soil it prefers clay and loam and it's just slightly um, on the alkaline side in terms of um, soil ph this is used for pain relief obviously we've seen that it would be used in operations it can be used in um, a military on if you watch world war ii films you see them often getting administered morphine after a bullet wound shot and also from um, opium um, and poppy seeds you actually can make other things like codeine but also on the on the worst end you can actually um, kind of make heroin here's just an example of this is in afghanistan that actually has the highest amount of opium uh, in the world just something to consider as a crossover idea the idea of power and borders and fragile states and how at the moment most of this opium is actually used to make heroin when it could be something that the country could use potentially in terms of making um, morphine and could be one of the the biggest world producers of morphine but unfortunately because of the governance in that country it doesn't and therefore we've got children picking uh, poppy um, seeds um, and making kind of heroin in in this fragile state. So I'm now going to talk about the example, which is the rosy periwinkle. It looks like this, and it's found um, native to Madagascar, which is again a warm tropical climate. It doesn't like frost. Um, it needs well-drained soils, and it needs just a slightly acidic soil. So this is a really important plant um, because it was something that. Scientists started to get interested in the kind of 50s and 60s. Natives had used it um, for a long, long time, indigenous tribes in Madagascar, and they'd used it for such things as diabetes. But what they actually found out, scientists, when they looked at it, was had all these things called alkaloids inside it, and there was 70 of them. But um, the company that, that was working on this was a, a USA company called Eli Lilly, and they actually found two alkaloids that they've used so vincristine which is used been used to kind of uh, in chemotherapy for childhood leukemia and it's been very very successful so the survival rates before the use of this drug were nearly 10 percent but now with the use of vincristine then 90 percent the other drug was uh, vinblastine and that is used um, in the treatment of hodgkin's lymphoma both of these have been very very successfully uh, used by early lily and uh, have become kind of famous drugs. The only thing that is difficult is that actually the scientists can't um, remake these alkaloids synthetically, so they can't make them in a lab. So they have to rely on the rosy periwinkle being commercially grown in places like Madagascar and Central Asia, where it's got a very similar climate, and then harvested by the locals there. There are issues to do with this, and um, obviously this product has made Eli Lilly very, very wealthy. Uh, last year, their total profits were close to six billion for all of their um, income, but but for Vin Christine and Verblastine, that would have contributed millions to it. Unfortunately, not very much of that money actually goes back to the indigenous people that live in Madagascar, and this is an idea that we actually call biopiracy. This is the idea where big pharmaceutical companies actually um, exploit the biological resources of a country or community and don't really pay fair compensation. So they're using knowledge that indigenous communities have had about what this drug could potentially do. They're then taking those drugs away and then very, very little compensation goes back to those uh, countries and communities. This is something that obviously Eli Lilly can, uh, would argue that they don't do, but it's something that we need to consider when looking about the idea of getting medicines from nature for our course.